Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. I should say maybe afternoon at this point. Um, we're really excited to have you. Um, Lynn's going to get started pretty soon here um, talking to us about transgender women's barriers to uh, mental health services. So we're really excited to have her. Uh, just a, a few quick things before we get started. Um, you can ask questions as we're going along in the chat box on the control panel, uh, either the chat box or in the questions tab, whichever you prefer. Um, and I will be moderating that and uh, watching those questions and we'll try to try to get those answered as you ask. Um, if you're having any issues, feel free to type in questions there as well. Um, so I'm gonna pass this over to Lynn. Uh, she is uh, really excited to present to us and she'll give you more information. All right, Lynn, go ahead. Okay, great, thanks. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to talk with you today about transgender women's barriers to mental health services. Before we get started, though, I'd like to tell you a little about myself and my background. And uh, just so that you um, know who's talking to you, um, I included a picture. Uh, I am the short one in the center there with the green hat. And those are my husband and friends of us, ours. Um, so since 2012, I've been the director of the Children's Resource Center. Uh, we're based in Harrisburg and Lebanon. This agency serves children who have been dis who have disclosed physical or sexual abuse or neglect, or who have witnessed a violent crime. The CRC staff conducts forensic interviews, medical exams, and trauma assessments with the nearly 1,200 children we see annually. Prior to 2012, I worked for the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. This agency supports rape crisis centers across Pennsylvania and provides them with technical assistance. During my almost 10 years with PCAR, I learned of the prevalence of sexual violence against transgender persons. It was during my graduate studies at Indiana University of Pennsylvania that I decided to take a closer look at the impact of sexual violence on this population and learn how rape crisis centers could meet their needs. When I realized that transgender women and transgender men faced very different challenges, I decided to focus my research more narrowly on transgender women. So some of the information I share with you today is specific to my reach, research and I can only say that as far as I know it applies to transgender women, I can't make the assumption about transgender men. However, I have looked at some additional research and uh, gathered some other information, so I will try to provide um, well-rounded information that could impact or influence both your care of, of both transgender women and transgender men. So the goals of our discussion today is um, I plan to define the terms related to transgender identity. While this may be a review for some, uh, I believe it's important to make sure we all understand the terminology, so I'll just spend a brief time uh, reviewing it. I'm also going to discuss the challenges transgender women face in navigating a bi-gender society. And a bi-gender society is one that leaves only room for male and female, um, and it assigns certain expectations to individuals based on their sex. So the United States, America, and Europe, and, and most of the world um, does only accept by gender. So you're either male or female. I'm going to discuss the barriers this population faces in accessing mental health services. And I'm finally, I'm going to describe ways mental health providers can create a welcoming environment for transgender women, and hopefully by extension, transgender men. I will break periodically to take questions and uh, you can type them in the, the uh, window and we will answer them um, you know, at periodic intervals. So um, the first term that I wanted to talk about is gender identity. And gender identity is really a person's internal and deeply held sense of their gender. It's who they think of when they think of themselves in terms of gender. Um, for transgender people, their own internal sense of gender identity does not match 
the sex assigned to them at birth. And I'd like to say that there's a very scientific way that people are assigned sex or gender at birth, but really what happens is you're born, the doctor looks at you, if you have a penis, you are a boy, if you don't, you're a girl. And that's how gender is assigned and that's how it follows people throughout their life. Gender expression is the external manifestation of gender and it's expressed through the person's name, the pronouns they use, clothing, haircut, behavior, voice, etc. Uh, what you're seeing in this picture is this is a transgender woman who is expressing herself in a typical American European norm of style for someone who is female. Again, that could be different in different cultures, but in our in our culture, this is she is appearing as someone that we would traditionally identify as female. Um, now the term transgender, that's really the umbrella term for people whose gender identity or expression differs from what is typically associated with the sex they were assigned at birth. And I think that's probably a pretty well-known term, but just wanted to review it. The terminology that's really uh, commonly used now to describe people who are transgender is um, transgender man and transgender woman. So um, a transgender man, man obviously is a person who is assigned female at birth, but identifies as a man and may live as a man or may not live as a man, but hopefully they do or if they want to. A transgender woman is a person who was assigned male at birth but identifies and lives as a woman. And I think the important thing that I found in my research is that individuals who are transgender, whether female or male, genuinely feel at their core that they are in the wrong body. So it is not someone that simply perhaps is a cross-dresser or something. It is a person that genuinely feels they were born with the wrong anatomy. And what I found is that most of them recognize this at a very young age. And when I say very young, about five. Um, most of them by the time they were five, six, seven, felt that there was something wrong with them. They may, and I'm not implying that being transgender, that there's something wrong with it, but they felt that there was something not right about their body. They did not feel comfortable as they were uh, with the normal societal expectations that were required of them. And some of them, it wasn't until they uh, were able to find s some information on a website that they said, oh, so that's what I, that's, that's the, sh the problem or the feelings that I'm having is that I am transgender and I never knew that. Now in terms of gender transition and affirmation, this is the process that individuals go through um, as they come to recognize, accept, and express their gender identity. And finally, the last term I want to present to you is cisgender. Um, and that is um, an individual who's sex and gender are aligned. Um, if you, so I am, I identify as cisgender. Um, I identify as female and I was born as female. Um, now I'm just going to talk briefly about gender and sexual orientation because I think sometimes people get a little confused. Um, the thing I want to say unequivocally is that being transgender does not mean someone is gay. Um, some individuals may identify as gay or lesbian, others do not. Um, as one person shared with me in my research, gender is who you go to bed as, sex is who you go to bed with. And um, Sarah Reisner, um, an associate research scientist at Fenway Institute in Boston, found that of transgender persons, 23% identify as heterosexual, 24 as bisexual, 23 as gay or lesbian, and 23% as queer. 
So if so, now moving on, uh, if you are interested in providing mental health services to transgender persons, it's imperative that um, education is provided to your staff and to everyone in your office who would be coming in contact with a transgender person. These are just some terms that um, that transgender persons find extremely offensive. And in my research, every single participant shared that they were routinely called by these pejorative terms. Sadly, uh, it was often by individuals in professional roles, such as doctors, dentists, police, emergency and department, emergency department workers. So these are very real uh, terms, and I think um, as social workers, you know, you can, you're sensitive to the idea of somebody being called it every single day. Uh, it, it certainly impacts uh, how they see the world and how they feel about themselves. Some other unhelpful questions or comments to avoid is that you don't want to ask them when they decided to be a man or a woman. Um, you look so real, I never would have known. Um, and you can read on. Um, you're so attractive, why would you want to blank? And you would be surprised uh, how many times um, people who are transgender are groped by total strangers who want to see what kind of anatomy they have. Again, uh, if you're considering treating transgender women, and again, I, I know I've gone back and forth a bit between transgender women and transgender persons, but based on the focus groups that I conducted, what I'm going to talk about now is the findings from that research, and this is related to transgender women specifically, but um, I would say based on what you hear here today, you may want to just do some additional reading to learn about um, how what I'm going to say may apply to transgender men. Um, they do, transgender women do face daily struggles in, in a bi-gender society. They are at very high risk for experiencing sexual violence. 50% um, of transgender persons report experiencing some form of sexual violence, whether it's um, groping in a sexual way, um, sexual assault, rape, and they are definitely at a higher risk than transgender men. Um, and teens are especially vulnerable. Many times teens uh, who are struggling with gender identity are either forced to leave their home or um, they leave because they're being physically abused by their parents because of their gender identity. And uh, once they live on the streets, they are often, um, the only way they can survive is, is, is with, through sex. And transgender women, as I said, are in particular much more likely to experience rape or sexual assault than transgender men and also cisgender women. So if you've read statistics on cisgender sexual assault, um, generally it's believed about 10% of the population of women, cisgender women, experience sexual violence. So it is much higher in trans with transgender women. Unemployment is um, a tremendous challenge faced by transgender women. Um, in my interview of 30 women, one third were under or unemployed. Um, I found it interesting that several of the participants waited until they retired from their place of employment because uh, to come out as transgender because they were concerned that they would either lose their job and lose their pension um, or they would be basically, well, as I said, fired. So um, it is a huge problem. And one young woman I spoke with said she couldn't even get a job at McDonald's. And uh, so it, it, it is a challenge for this population. Homelessness, homelessness is also um, quite a challenge. Um, there are no protections in states um, that prevent transgender persons, transgender women, from being evicted from apartments for their gender identity and expression. They are often turned away from homeless shelters. And if a transgender woman goes to a domestic violence shelter 
because of domestic violence issues, they, and not in all cases, but in many cases, are turned away. If they want to stay in a homeless shelter as a transgender woman, they must dress as a man to do so. Um, so, you know, again, that is something that is quite a challenge to them. In my research uh, of the 30 people I spoke with, four were homeless, uh, living in shelters, or on the verge of, of becoming homeless. Transgender women and transgender persons in, in general, I can make that statement about both men and women, um, face tremendous um, family rejection. Um, I think that was pretty evident um, in, in everyone I spoke with. Their families didn't talk to them, daughters, sons didn't talk to them, um, cousins, what have you, um, parents. They just felt incredibly rejected. Uh, also, in the case of the transgender women, their families, if they did talk to them, would not refer to them by their chosen name, but would continually refer to them by their birth name. Oh. Uh, Lynn, we have a question here from Emily. Um, sure. She asks, how can we advocate for policy change to protect transgender people in Pennsylvania? Uh, and it, for example, housing, employment, and dis discrimination? Well, you can work uh, a couple things. Um, there are some transgender uh, groups that I will share with you at the end, uh, transgender rights groups. And uh, the Human Relations Commission in Pennsylvania actually does advocate on behalf of transgender persons and transgender rights. So I would recommend that you go to the Human Relations Commission and see what you can find there because they do um, ask for advocates. And again, um, there are some transgender rights groups that, that can help with policy. Uh, one more. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one more uh, question here. Um, Kevin, I think that you had asked, uh, what is NASW doing? And uh, had taken the question back. Um, <laughs> that is something that definitely w we have a new advocacy person on staff. I don't know if everyone knows that. It's very exciting, though. Um, and that's Benny Brown. Um, and this is definitely something that's on his docket as we look forward to um, policy changes and what we're going to be advocating for, what's on our legislative agenda for the upcoming year and a couple years, um, and just bills that we're, we're choosing to focus on. So it's very exciting to see him getting into that role. Um, and also another question here from Amanda, is it appropriate to ask a client what pronoun he or she prefers to be called by? Yes, and that is exactly, when I get to that section, um, we will talk about s how you can advocate and, and um, serve transgender persons, and that is perfectly fine. They would prefer that. So now getting back to um, the harassment um, perspective, um, every person that I spoke with in the 30 that I, that I interviewed talked about being groped, called he, she, it. Um, several shared, um, again, that people just would come up and grope them. Um, many of them felt threatened uh, by verbal harassment. You know, you would think, like from my perspective as a cisgender woman, I would feel more threatened or I do feel more threatened by a person, say, groping me than somebody calling to me on the streets or name calling. But I found that transgender women actually fear that name calling um, more so than the groping and, and that type of thing because they are very afraid that, um, especially with there's one or two individuals harassing them, that it could end up in a physical altercation. That not that, that the transgender woman would initiate it, but that the individuals would, um, you know, fight with them, um, beat them up, that type of thing. So they actually feared that type of thing um, quite a bit. Um, depression and suicide is also something that transgender women struggle with. Uh, many have contemplated suicide either before or after they transitioned. Uh, they described feeling hopeless and overwhelmed by the challenges and barriers they face. And many of them said that the, the only reason they did not 
commit suicide or attempt is that they had one person in their corner. So somebody who accepted them as they are and advocated for them and helped them feel not so hopeless. And unfortunately, it's a reality that transgender persons and transgender women, of course, um, face the very possibility of being killed. And in the United States in 2016, 29 transgender persons were killed because of their gender expression, identity and expression. In Philadelphia, uh, I included some names and photos of uh, two transgender women that were killed in 2016. Now, uh, I'm just going to take a break real quickly here and see uh, if there's additional questions. Uh, we do have one question in the docket here. Um, this is from Kevin. He says, uh, as the visibility of the transgender community has increased, do you think there is an increase or a decrease in harassment, stigma, and barriers to service? Um, I think it hasn't, I don't think things have progressed very much, to be honest, um, even if there is more visibility. Um, initially, I would have said that I don't think it's worse than it was before. Now, I think it's either the same or worse. I don't think it's better. Um, part of it is the political climate. Um, I think that that has negatively impacted transgender persons. Um, yeah, so I, I don't feel, I, I feel it's gotten worse or stay neutral. I'm sorry, that was sort of a convoluted answer, but um, I don't think it's better. Let, let's put it that way. Yeah. Now to the topic at hand. Um, some of you may recognize this person, uh, David Letterman. He retired um, from television a number of years ago, but he used to do this little skit of the top 10 whatever, top 10 reasons, you know, why I would go outside today um, or what, but this is the top 10 barriers that prevent transgender women from seeking mental health services. First is that providers are not adequately trained to address the needs of transgender women. And we will talk about these a little bit more later, so I'm just gonna go through them. The counselor in, the, in one case that someone told me, they tried to convince the transgender woman she's just confused and um, although one person said those exact words, others did imply that um, counselors had said to them, well, you'll get over this, you're confused, you know, you're just not thinking right. Some transgender women were refused treatment by a mental health or medical provider. They, they went to, they called for an appointment. They said, I'm, in, I'm transgender and the um, office staff said, well, we don't treat people that are transgender. If the transgender woman did get to an appointment or, or you know, made the appointment, came to the office, they often perceived that they were treated differently than other clients and um, perhaps would even leave the office before they ever got to see the provider. Transgender women often don't have health care or sufficient coverage within their health care policies to obtain mental health services. Sometimes the person's employer or family is unaware that they are a transgender woman. And you may say, well, how can that be? And because they live as a man in their low in their city or work as a man and leave the area to, uh, you know, to, to dress as a transgender woman and, uh, you know, maybe get services. Um, one of the people in my group actually said that they were in a car accident dressed as, as a transgender woman and nobody in their family knew that, nor did their employers. So they actually went home and changed their clothes before going to the hospital because they were afraid of being outed. Um, transgender women are concerned that mental health providers don't understand their needs. And I know I number 10 sort of was like that as well. Uh, but that is a huge um, barrier for them. Uh, if they were treated disrespectfully previously by a counselor or a physician, if they're seeing a doctor, it makes them very, very reluctant to reach out and try to um, 
to get services from someone else. Front office staff being disrespectful was also a huge barrier. And it's really those sort of subtle things that may seem subtle to us, where it's the looks that one front office staff person gives another, they roll their eyes, make snide comments that they think that the transgender woman doesn't hear. Um, you know, the pointing and laughing at the, the patient's chart. So it's really making them feel um, tremendously um, devalued. And finally, um, office staff, even though number two might relate to number one, it's really stumbling over the pronouns, addressing the person incorrectly, calling someone who is dressed as a woman, calling them a man. Um, so it's, it's not knowing, the front staff not knowing how to interact or speak respectfully to someone who's transgender. And in my research, the things I learned, the most important things I feel I learned, was that transgender persons rely heavily on the endorsement of peers when seeking mental health services. So in other words, if somebody hasn't vouched for a provider, they are very unlikely to seek services from that individual. The second most important thing I learned, and so you think, well, how could there, isn't there just one most important thing? Sort of, but I felt that these were all of equal value. When the trust is destroyed by a staff member, it, you can rarely go back. Once a staff member, whether it's your front office staff, whether it's a counselor or whomever, if they treat the, the individual disrespectfully or give them have a ne negative attitude, they are unlikely to go back and they're really that office will have a reputation. You know, you don't want to go there because they don't treat you well. Um, also, again, transgender women are unlikely to seek services from someone they don't know. You, if you are interested in this population, you must truly immerse yourself in their community. So in other words, just putting up a sign saying, we treat transgender women is not enough. Um, for me to do my focus groups and to be able to have the trust of the groups, I actually attended um, their support groups several times. So I conducted four, four focus, five focus groups across Pennsylvania. And in each case, I would attend their support groups one or two times to build trust before I then was able to conduct the focus group. So uh, I'll just break here a moment. Are there some additional questions? Okay. So we have yeah. uh, at least one question here um, from Jeremy, and he says, how do we address non-co-ed inpatient facilities? Oh, <laughs> I think that we're, if, it's important that you have policies in place. I, I don't mean to be generic or say that in a general way, but as an agency, you need your agency needs to decide how it's going to handle it and put policies in place so that staff know how to handle it. So if you have, um, say, okay, so non-co-ed, so you would might have a transgender person who female who shows up, you need to have a space for that person if. If you want to treat them with dignity and respect, you need to figure out a way to do it. Whether it's, um, for instance, we talk a lot about um, bathroom access. If if there were single person bathrooms, that bathroom access would not be an issue. So it's really being serious about wanting to accommodate and to make transgender people feel comfortable and then changing your policies to address that. Okay. Now, in terms of reducing barriers to mental health access, um, these are some things that you can put in place both with your staff and, and just with everybody that comes in contact with someone who is transgender. And that is to refer to the person by their preferred name and pronoun. And if you are unsure, ask. Uh, I found the individuals I spoke with very... Um, sincere, very interested, um, because I was interested. So they um, 
no matter what I asked, they were very open and accommodating because they felt a level of trust. And because if I didn't know, I asked. So examples, what name would you like me to use during our appointment? How do you identify? They would much prefer that uh, you ask than just assume. You want to become familiar with commonly used terms and the diversity of identities, including fluid non-binary identification. Uh, one of the individuals that I spoke with um, identified both as a man and a woman. It depended on the day. So there would be times that he, that he preferred to be called by his male name. He dressed as male. And then there were other times that she dressed as female female and preferred to be called by her female name. Um, so I, I think it's being open and um, being willing to hear things that you think, wow, this I never thought about that, um, and being non-judgmental about it. Um, and again, become familiar with the transgender community. There are a number of transgender support groups in Harrisburg, York. Uh, I went to one outside of Philadelphia. And all and Lancaster, and they were all extremely willing to have me come and learn about them and learn about their struggles and their challenges. Never was anyone um, unkind or rude. In fact, very gracious. Uh, also, you could attend the Transgender Day of Remembrance, and most communities have those. Uh, there, it's always November twentieth, and they. Um, basically, transgender persons and allies come out and recognize and honor individuals that were killed over the past year because of their gender identity and expression. Um, be non-judgmental, open, and professional. And I worked in healthcare in direct service for many years, and I always tell this story um, because as a provider, as a social worker, you know that there is almost, you have to almost put on your professional hat and leave the judgments at the door. And when I was in healthcare, in direct healthcare, I remember one of my patients was a member of the KKK. Now, I had feelings about that, but I treated that person exactly as I would every other patient. I treated them with kindness and with dignity. And regardless of my personal feelings. So again, if this is a population um, that you want to embrace, you need to really recognize that and leave the judgments at the door. Um, you also would want to update the forms that you use. So um, ensure that your patient data forms include options for assigned sex at birth for the current gender identity. Um, include an indication, so identify the record is as this person is transgender, transfemale, she prefers to go by this name. Um, and one of the resources that I have at the end, you can actually go in and there are sample um, forms that you can use, uh, you know, to help guide you in changing your forms. And you want to create a transgender-friendly office. Uh, display signs and health-related materials that recommend gender diversity. Post non-discriminatory policies in your public places. Provide single occupancy or gender-neutral restrooms. And I would say this is the restroom issue is huge um, for transgender persons. Uh, they really, and it's a conundrum because if they are dressed as female and they go into a female bathroom, they're afraid security will be called and they will be pulled out. And in fact, that has happened. Yet if they are dressed as female and they go into the men's restroom, they're concerned they're going to be beaten up. And one person, and it's not funny, but they did laugh about it. They said, yeah, when I go to the restroom, I decide, do I wanna get thrown out or beat up? It's one of those two choices. So if your agency does not have gender neutral bathrooms, I encourage you to work towards that. And gender neutral mean, could mean something as simple as having a single stall bathroom. Another thing that you can do is to train your frontline staff. Um, you don't wanna have them say, good morning, ma'am, good morning, sir. 
just how may I help you today? Um, if they are unsure, and I appreciate the individual that asked the question, do we ask? Perfectly okay to ask. And even couch it in, I, I want to be respectful. I want to be sure that we're meeting your needs. I Please tell me how you prefer that I refer to you. Uh, how, what gender do you identify as and how do you would you like to be called as a male or female and apologize and i did plenty of that when i was interviewing people i would say things that i would apologize for because i i said i didn't mean to say what i said i just am uninformed and i'm trying to become more informed and they everyone i found was very open to that uh, and ask only ask information you need and really practice with staff because if you if a person has never interacted with someone who is transgender it does take some practice it takes practice so that you can say very quickly or very easily how would you like me to refer to you you know so that it's not stilted and everyone runs around with their hair on fire when someone who's transgender walks into the office. That it is routine that you see that individual exactly as you do every other client who comes into your office. Oops. And so I say I just recommend that you treat all clients as you would like to be treated. Now I have some um, resources for you. Um, the trans transgender.org that provides a lot of information about the transgender movement uh, they also one of the things I most appreciate about them is they update their um, press packet so you are probably going to say I'm not press why would I want that but they keep update on the up to date most of the the pronouns um, the way people want to be uh, referred to and they update it often so if you want to know the most current language it is good to refer to their press package they also have a lot of information about advocacy um, trainings they offer a lot of additional trainings about caring for this population glad is another organization that has some good resources um, P flag. Um, so does HRC, which I, that is the Human um, Relations Commission. And um, finally, the last one, and where I did get some of my information, is the last resource. And they do have webinars on um, treating and serving transgender persons. And here is my contact information. I'm bringing my the long and the short of it, I just have to throw that out for my little dachshund, the long and the short of it is that if you have questions, concerns, uh, you're welcome to call me. Um, I'm happy to, to either point you in the direction or um, you know try to find the resource for you. And I would like to open it to questions. Yeah, I'll go ahead and say um, <clears throat> I've seen a few of you, I think, Raising your hand is a thing that you can do through this uh, this platform. Um, if you do have a question, just go ahead into the questions tab on the control panel. Um, you can type it in there, and we will be happy to answer those. Um, we do have a couple things here, Lynn. Um, this is from Amanda, and she asks, what can I do to help a client obtain a transgender-friendly primary care doctor, a specialist, uh, mental health care? I don't know where and how to start with this, and any suggestions would help mm -hmm. in terms of researching these resources. Um, I think a good first step is you could contact one of the transgender support groups. And again, if you uh, simply Google transgender support group in Pennsylvania, uh, there's a very large one in Harrisburg. There, again, there's one in York. And if you call the, the person who coordinates the group, they can help steer you in the right direction. They can give you names. Um, again, because it, it is such a tight-knit community. They rely on each other. Um, in fact, we, almost, we, we say that they really have sort of a kinship type of relationship. If somebody needs a ride, they provide rides for one another, clothing, homes, whatever. And so they are very connected to who, what physicians and what mental health providers serve this population. 
So I would start with the support groups and just reach out and ask them. Um, there's also an agency in Lancaster, and I actually did one of my support groups or one of my focus groups there. And of course, oh, Alder Health, A L D E R H E A L T H, Alder Health. They have counselors that specialize in working with transgender um, individuals, and they also have their pulse pretty much on uh, physicians in the area that can help prescribe hormones, things like that. Great, thanks. Um, Amy actually writes in, and this isn't as much a question, but just some input that I thought was really cool. Uh, she says, in my township, White Marsh, we adopted an ordinance to protect the rights of all persons to remain free of discrimination and discriminatory practices in employment, housing, and commercial property, uh, as well as public accommodation. We feel it's a uh, high public importance, um, uh, of high public importance to adopt appropriate legislation to ensure all persons enjoy the full benefit of citizenship and are afforded equal opportunities. And she just added as well, this is something that all communities can adopt and we can advocate for this, mm -hmm. which obviously yeah, we can definitely agree that's, with that's that. That's a great idea. Yeah, um, that's, that's awesome. awesome that it would be done and, and it is happening I, at some at the local level, but yeah, we're not quite ready to get to the federal level yet. Yeah, Emma, Emma writes in, uh, how can we get a copy of the resources? Emma, that's a great question. Um, in the control panel, you'll see a tab for handouts. Um, and there should be one there that's actually a PDF of what Lynn shared today. So feel free to click that and you can download that and uh, look that over at your leisure later. Um, Kevin writes, uh, well done. Thank you, Lynn. Much important Thank you. information and we definitely appreciate that, Kevin. Uh, Bonnie, Bonnie says, are you aware of professionals such as social workers who are themselves transgender and who reach out to this population to offer professional mental health services? There, I know of two transgender women who um, offer mental health services. And I, I would say connect with Alder Health uh, because they can provide you with their exact contact information. Great, yeah. Uh, Gillian has a question here, I believe. Uh, the Bradbury Sullivan Center in Allentown, PA, uh, Lehigh County, will help with absolutely anything. Therapy, legal issues, PCP support groups, housing, et cetera, great organization. I guess that's not a question, but that is a great resource. Uh, definitely something to keep in mind. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, Emily adds TransCentral PA is also a good resource, mm -hmm. and that's TransCentralPA.org. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. Uh, she also has a question. Oh, this is a different Emily uh, has a question. Do you have any tips in encouraging clients who identify as transgender and may have already had a bad experience in seeking mental health support? Wow, that's a tough one because uh, as I said, there's uh, there were a number of people that I spoke with who said they would absolutely not go to a counselor or therapist because of their bad experience. But if I would encourage if they could connect with another person who's transgender and ha who had a good experience, that might be helpful. Um, again, there's a very tight-knit community and so they may, somebody else who is transgender may be able to, to convince them to seek services. And especially if that person can vouch for the mental health provider. Great, yeah, we have another compliment here from uh, Herb and that he said, a great presentation, thank you, Lynn. Uh, thank you, and we appreciate you guys attending. Um, Kevin writes in as well. Mazzoni Center in Philadelphia offers mental health services specifically for the transgender community. Uh, so look at this. You already are all becoming allies because you all have resources that you can share. So you'll have to get them on the NASW website. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Thank you guys so much for contributing and having those resources ready. Uh, sounds like you guys are already experts in some ways yourself, so mm -hmm. we, we definitely appreciate that. Um, Lynn, since we have a few minutes left, mm -hmm. oh, real quick, Emily also writes, uh, don't forget to use your local LGBT center uh, for help. The LGBT center in Harrisburg mm -hmm. is also a great place. Yeah, thanks again, Emily. I appreciate that. Um, since we have a few minutes left and we got to we gotta 
fill a little bit of time for these continuing education credits. I feel like um, I should like do a song and dance. I'm sorry. No, I, no, no. I wanted, I didn't want to run over an hour, so I tried to speak quickly. No, this is perfect. Actually, we were speaking beforehand a little bit about what you do currently. And I think that okay. people might be really interested to hear that if you have okay. sort of a five minute, you know, elevator oh, sure. pitch about. Okay, I'll speak really slowly. He's, yeah, no, that's no you can't have Tyler here. He's like doing that stretch thing, you know, where you stretch out the, you know, you can't see it, but I'm doing it. Um, well, anyway, so I am um, the director of the Children's Resource Center. And I've been there, as I said in my opening, since 2012. Um, that is a child advocacy center. There are about somewhere, I'd say close to 30, 27 to 30 in Pennsylvania. And what we do is we interview children, provide a medical exam and conduct trauma assessments when there's a child that there's an allegation of abuse. So we see children who have physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, um, children who have witnessed um, a violent crime, and they get to us through investigative agencies. So when you, let's say you see a child and there's, um, you know, the child discloses something happened to them, to you, and you make your child line report, it goes to children and youth and law enforcement. They then contact my center and we coordinate an appointment with all the interested parties. And the reason that you would think, well, why would they need to have a place that coordinates it? It's because children and youth and law enforcement have very different um, a, a very different focus when there's an allegation of child abuse. Um, children and youth agencies have a uh, very short time, turnaround time. Uh, they have different criteria and sometimes the agencies don't communicate so things drop through the cracks. Plus, um, it's very difficult to, to interview a child. It may not seem that way, but, um, but we do our interviews, we conduct them in a way that is non-leading and non-suggestive so that when a case finally gets to court, the defense attorney can't say, well, you know, you changed your statement six times. We actually conduct the interview, non-leading, non-suggestive, and we tape the interview. Well, not tape it. We now burn it on a DVD. Law enforcement and children and youth sit in the adjacent room and watch the interview. Parents, we don't allow parents to watch. Um, after the child's interviewed, we then conduct a full medical exam. We take photos if needed, if it's physical abuse and neglect. We then use, it's called the UCLA PTSD Trauma Index. And what we do, we administer it both to the child and their caregiver. And what it does is it's a subjective evaluation of their level of PTSD. Um, what we found interesting is very often parents will say, oh, my kid's fine. They're not, you know, troubled by anything. And yet the child is off the charts with, with PTSD. So then we are able to refer them for trauma therapy. Um, we do have a location in Harrisburg and Lebanon. Um, we see about 1,200 kids a year from Dauphin, Cumberland, Perry, and Lebanon counties. And we also see about... 50 to 60 children from Schuylkill County. So um, we try to provide this comprehensive service. We give kids um, really a, a place that they can explain or describe what happened to them. And one of, the, I think, the strengths of our um, interviewers is that kids will tell them the worst thing that's ever happened to the, them and the interviewer does not respond. So we're not in a therapeutic environment or a therapeutic, that's not the outcome or the goal. It is to hear children's statements in a way that is non-leading and non-suggestive. So we can't ask them what happened with your uncle. You know, we they have to say it, they have to elicit it. But again, what the kids tell us is that it's, you know, when they've said something, and I'm sure we've all had that experience, you've told someone who you think is your best friend something really terrible or embarrassing, and they make a face, or they get upset, or they respond. It makes you feel like crap. So our 
interviewers hear these stories and it really takes away a lot of the child's shame because we don't react or they don't react in a negative way. Um, you know, that's just a huge thing for them. The medical piece is also huge because first of all, we make sure the child's healthy. Uh, we make sure they are not pregnant. They don't have a sexually transmitted infection, but we also in, reassure them that their body's okay because many kids will say to us, is somebody going to be able to tell that that something happened to me? And we can reassure them that no, it's not going, no one can tell. So we really provide a neutral environment for the child. Um, if their family is the alleged offender, we don't allow the family on site. Somebody else has to transport the child. We want them to have a free and neutral place to, to talk about their abuse. And we also will not allow children to incriminate themselves. So if they start talking about how they did something that broke the law, we kind of shut them down in a nice way. So that's what we do. Yeah, I thought that was so great. It's such a great resource and so interesting to see how it's grown over the years too. Yeah. Um, you were saying how you used to have such a huge caseload for the whole, you know, all those yeah, counties. Yep. Yeah, there's many more child advocacy centers. Back 25, 23 years ago when we started, there were only three in the Commonwealth, one in Philly, one in Pittsburgh, and then Harrisburg. And now it's grown, but yet we're seeing more children because of changes to the law, education of police officers and children and youth. Yeah. Great, yeah, we, we do have a couple more questions. We have a few minutes left here, so uh, this is great. And uh, one relating to children, actually, as you're on the topic. Um, uh, do you have any information on transgender children? Are abuse rates higher or lower? Any advice for children and youth caseworkers working with this population? Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of abuse rates, we. We do not see many transgender children. Um, I would say we've seen, and I think it's just because, you know, at, at the age of 12, 13, 14, they may not have come out as transgender. So we, I would say at this point, no, we don't see more children um, who are transgender that are abused. Um, that being said, that doesn't mean they're not out there because again, transgender children may run away from home that you know they're they're out there they are not nobody's reporting that they're being abused so i wouldn't say that it doesn't happen but we're not seeing it at our center awesome thank awesome. you so much bailey mm -hmm. um yeah we have one more question here from amy um she asks uh, can you explain the identification as queer rather than gay or lesbian and she added this refers back to percentages yeah. regarding how to identify sexual orientation? It's really um, just the person's individual, um, how they prefer to be known. So um, some people who are gay or lesbian just prefer to be called that, while others just prefer queer. Cool, yeah. And uh, just to sort of finish up, Janet had one more resource. Um, she said there's online counseling services with 2,000, you know, over 2,000 counselors to choose from that specialize in uh, working with transgender folks. So um, one that she mentioned was BetterHelp. I'm not, I'm not familiar with it, but I'm not either. definitely I'm not. something that people can check out if they're interested. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming in. Oh, it was great, great yeah. fun. Glad to get some, some the word out and uh, good, luck good luck with, with uh, your care of your patients. And if you are working with transgender persons, um, great, great. They really need some some support. Yeah, and it looks like you uh, you have your contact information here. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, people can take note of that. And um, uh, just to recap, there's the handout section in the control panel here. Um, so if you want to download the PowerPoint that Lynn used today, you can go into the handout section and just click that and you should be able to download that. Um, for people interested in getting their continuing education credit, we're definitely uh, able to do that. So um, if you're licensed or whatever, we can get you that one credit um, certificate. Um, and how that's going to work is we're going to send out a email to everyone that attended and it'll have a link to an evaluation form. So once you go in and fill that out, it'll be real quick, just a two minute little thing. Um, and our continuing education 
people here, we'll send those over to you uh, via email. Um, if you need a printed copy, we can do that as well. So don't worry, we'll be in touch very soon and you'll get those credits. Um, thank you again, Lynn. You're welcome and, and thanks to everyone on the on the call. Yeah, definitely. Thank you guys so much for just contributing and having those resources and um, for asking questions. It was a really great time. And uh, just be in touch. Um, check out nasw-pa.org. We're going to have more uh, webinars coming up monthly. We're going to try to do these. So um, if you're looking to get some continuing education credit or just learn about a new po new topic, um, definitely be in touch and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch with, with updates. So. Thank you guys and, and have a great day. Wonderful. Boy, a very engaged group.